Brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. Francis just broke the law. Canon law governs how the church operates. It governs every minutia of how the church operates, including the actions of the Supreme Pontiff. Canon law can be amended, but no one is above the law of the church. Not even the man the world thinks is the Pope. And Francis just broke that law. How did he do it? Francis broke the law at the consistory, and in so doing, he continued a pattern of disregarding the rules and norms of the church and of the faith in order to push his program of remaking the church into the image and likeness of the world and of the world's master. And he did it because no one is going to hold him accountable. And here's what makes this all the more rich. His actions fit perfectly with the rest of the program he's run on the faith, especially in his moves against the traditional liturgy, which his henchmen have said some profoundly immoral things about lately. Francis broke canon law in his appointment of the new bishops and new cardinals at the consistory. Matt Gaspers of Catholic Family News broke the story this month, and no one else has covered it, which is strange. Mr. Gaspers did this on Twitter, where he provides the following information for us. From his post there, quote, Francis has now also violated the Apostolic Constitution Universi Dominici Gregis of 1996, which specifies in paragraph 33, the maximum number of cardinal participants must not exceed 120. There are now 132 cardinals who can participate, which is illegal. Granted, the Pope is the supreme legislator in the church, so he could amend Universi, Universi Dominici Gregis to allow for more than 120 participants. The point is that he's flagrantly disregarding the current law of the church, as if it doesn't matter, like a dictator. End quote. And that is actually what makes this strange. Francis can do what he loves to do the most, issue a wordy, lengthy motu proprio, and with a wave of his hand, change canon law to make a limitless number of cardinals who can participate and he could do it without any effort, but he doesn't do that. What he's done is sloppy and illegal. But in the grand scheme of things, it's really not all that surprising. Universal Dominici Gregis was promulgated by John Paul II to govern the rules of papal conclaves. Popes frequently change how conclaves are run, and it, but this document still stands. And a conclave is where a pope is chosen by his peers, if you don't know. The canon in question reads as follows. Quote, paragraph 33. The right to choose the Roman pontiff belongs exclusively to the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, with the exception of those who have reached their 80th birthday before the day of the Roman pontiff's death or the day when the apostolic see becomes vacant. Notice here, by the way, that it also leaves wiggle room for a resignation. Continuing. The maximum number of cardinal participants must not exceed 120 the right of active participation by any other ecclesiastical dignitary or the intervention of any lay power of whatsoever greater order is absolutely excluded, end quote. No layman may, may interfere in this process. Paragraph 40 is cited there, and it refers to circumstances where a cardinal would try to not participate for a variety of reasons and what to do under those circumstances should they arise, in case anybody was curious. So will a new motu proprio fix this? Possibly. If Francis doesn't issue one, it will create headaches at the next conclave because some people will probably try to restrict some of the new participants from participating. But Francis has one of his most loyal minions serving as Cameron Lango, Cardinal Joseph Nighty Knight Tobin. So that's unlikely to be an obstacle for the full participation of these illicitly raised cardinals. The Cameron Lango is someone who just governs the conclave. The aim for all these extra cardinals is to stack the deck for the next conclave, and given that we're now standing at 62% of the cardinals who will participate in the next conclave, having been chosen by Francis, it stands to reason that he likes the odds of a man of his liking becoming the next pope. And that's disregarding both the possibility of another consistory next year to elevate more men to the office of cardinal, which is probably going to happen, especially given that there will be a wave of cardinals retiring in the next year, as well as archbishops, especially in the United States, where Francis has his baleful eye fixed due to the resistance of traditionus custodis that is widespread among the bishops in America. Many of them are also going to retire, 
which allows more shuffling of the deck. On that front, bishops are now reporting privately, by the way, to priests in their dioceses that Rome is beginning to force their hand on Traditionis Custodis. Bishops who have not implemented Traditionis Custodis to the liking of Rome are now being told that they have to ask permission to keep their apostolic mass offerings. Think about that for a moment. And if apparently a bishop resists that move, or if you and I speak out against it, guess what? We are now a Protestant, according to Cardinal Arthur Roach. Headline from Crux, which professes to be taking the Catholic pulse. Vatican's liturgy czar says church makes tradition, not people in lobbies. After being made a cardinal, Roach became Papa Bile, by the way, meaning eligible to be Pope in the eyes of the cardinals of the church. He has a key position in the Roman Curia. His attitude about things are known, and to the modernist, he might be an attractive choice for the papal throne. His chances are small compared to Togle or a few others, but he is still considered Papa Bile. I hope that possibility doesn't give you nightmares, by the way. If it does, I apologize. From the article, quote, Cardinal Arthur Roach, head of the Vatican's liturgy department, has warned against the politicization of debates over different forms of the mass and has stressed the church's role as the one that makes and passes on tradition. When it comes to the traditional Latin mass, quoting him directly now, you touch this area and everyone starts screaming. That should tell us something straight away, Roach said. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't touch it. <laughs> Saying the often quote-unquote hysterical reaction to Pope Francis's decision last year to tighten permissions for celebrating the pre-Vatican II liturgy are concerning. <laughs> yeah, I bet they are. Regarding those who argue that the reforms rolled out by Pope Paul VI and Pope Francis are contrary to church tradition, Roach warned that, quote, we've got to be very careful because the church passes on the tradition and it's the church that makes the tradition. It's not people in lobbies that create the tradition, end quote. I guess uh, if you're a commentator now and you're, or you're someone who goes to visit Rome to beg them not to do this, you're now a lobbyist. Wonderful. So Roach basically just said that Francis is the church and that the big T traditions of the faith can be changed by Francis and the council if they want. That's not true, but that is what we're dealing with here, folks. People who do not understand the rule of law and the role of sacred tradition in the church. Yes, the rule of law exists within the church as well. Francis can no more change the traditions of the faith than can you or I. He is the actual guardian of tradition. It's safeguard, or that's what he's supposed to be at any rate. Instead, he acts as a dictator, not only with the liturgy, but with how his predecessor will be, or his successor rather, will be chosen. But this gets even worse because if you cling to the same mass said by St. Thomas Aquinas or attended by St. Catherine of Siena or St. John Fisher or name any preconciliar saint, you are now a Protestant. Quote, all I can say is that my dicastery is very open to talking to people, and that during the course of this past year, since the publication of Traditionis Custodis, I have received so-called, quote-unquote, traditionalist groups, but we've got to be very careful, because the church passes on the tradition, and it's the church that makes the tradition. It's not people in lobbies that create the tradition, but it's the church in faithfulness to that. I always think that for me as an Englishman, as a great example to me is our history, our Reformation history. Get a load of this, folks. Where our young priests were harmed and very cruelly ended for two things. For the Mass and in faithfulness to the See of Peter. In faithfulness to the Pope. Whenever we celebrate Mass, we we'll always mention as a point of unity, first, that we're in union with the Pope. And second, that we're in union with the Bishop, who is in union with the Pope. If you take that seriously, then it raises for all of us an examination of conscience with regard with how we view that. Is that really something we view seriously, or are we trying to create another church? Are we trying to be Protestant instead of Catholic? End quote. The gall of this man. I mean, seriously, there is something extraordinarily and especially sleazy about invoking the English martyrs of the Reformation as a defense of banning the Latin Mass, especially since the English martyrs gave their lives for that Mass, for the Mass we're advocating for, and for the faith. But then again, the modernists have taken some of the great doctors and saints of the church, like St. Ignatius of Antioch and St. Vincent of Larens, and co-opted them and twisted the things they had to say to defend their heresies, when 
often those saints actually condemn them. So nothing is beneath them at this point. Now, if you're not sure why the liturgy is such a battleground in the church or how it's connected to all the cardinal stuff going on, it's actually pretty simple. The liturgy is the expression of the faith. It is the expression of what we believe. And the apostolic mass and the Novus Ordo express, frankly, different things. By the admission of the modernist liturgists themselves, including Cardinal Roach, this battle for the liturgy is explained well by Bishop Varden of Norway in an interview he gave with the Pillar. Bishop Varden is a Trappist brewmaster, so if you're interested in that whole side of the faith, I recommend reading the interview that I will be quoting from here in a moment. And I have a link to it in today's show notes at returntotradition.org. Just look for the post with today's episode title, and you'll find the link there. And the reason I post links on that website is there's no ads on that website, at least not, not yet anyway, but and our hosts don't permit us to put links to things with websites or with ads. But anyway, but Bishop Varden describes this issue perfectly for us. Quote, because it, the liturgy, touches all of us intimately. That's why there's a battleground. And also because the liturgy brings us together and calls on us to participate to some extent in the performance of a rite, in that we all have our parts to play. It calls on us to submit personal preference to a common plan. That is always difficult in any context because I want to do my thing. That's one reason why it's such a hot potato. Another is that it's a historical fact that over the last 60 to 70 years, we've just lived in such an experimental universe with so many various and quite often incompatible notions of liturgy being bandied about that our nerves are a bit frayed. No kidding. There's also an atmosphere of anxiety, which to some Catholics has come to seem constitutional. I don't think it needs to be. What matters as always is to go deep in terms of the history to which we now are the heirs, the time has come to look dispassionately with appreciation, but also with a critical eye on some of the accomplishments of the past decades and to ask what is an enrichment and what isn't. What really matters is to root oneself again and again and ever more firmly at the salvific core of the liturgy to remember that we are not the subjects of the liturgy. It is fundamentally Christ who is the subject of the liturgy. We engage in it as a way of communing with him and to touch the unfolding of the redemption of humankind. That's what matters, to keep that rootedness clear. End quote. And folks, that is why the liturgy is such a battleground in the church now. Because how we worship Christ ultimately frames how we understand the faith. Think of it this way. If we worship in a man-oriented way, our blessed Lord, then we are much more likely to have a man-oriented understanding of the faith than if we worship in a way that requires us in some way greater surrender to the liturgy itself. And that is the core of the problem. Cardinal Roach once said something incredible about all this. He himself has said that the apostolic mass is not compatible with the theology of the church after Vatican II. He said it himself. He said it himself that they're frankly two different religions. Well, he didn't quite go as far as to explicitly call it two different religions because he knows that would give the game away. But, no, but now what? Maybe you think the next conclave with all these new cardinals will happen and the Holy Ghost will choose a pope for us who is holy. Benedict XVI reminds us that the Holy Ghost does not choose the pope. I'm not sure where the idea comes from that the Holy Ghost chooses a pope but it's not what the church has ever taught. And Benedict categorically rejects that idea. Quoting Benedict in a book that he was interviewed for some time ago about all this, quote, there are too many contrary instances of popes the Holy Spirit would obviously not have picked. I would say that the spirit does not exactly take control of the affair, but rather like a good educator, as it were, leaves us much space, much freedom, without entirely abandoning us. Thus, the spirit's role should be understood in a much more elastic sense. Not that he, the Holy Ghost, dictates the candidate for whom one must support. Probably the only assurance he offers is that the thing cannot be totally ruined. End quote. In other words, in simpler English, the cardinals still have free will to act as they please. The Holy Ghost would not choose some of the wicked men who have been Pope in the past since God does not ally himself with evil. But I'm curious what you think about the elevation of all these new cardinals, how that intersects with the issue of the liturgy and the future of these liturgical battlegrounds in the church. 
and who you think out of them is likely to be the next pope, not who you want, but who you think is likely. So let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. And like and subscribe if you haven't, it really does help. It's just sharing these messages on social media that helps a lot as well. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.